This is Real Ghost Stories Online. When someone's life it ends in a very tragic, sudden way, does the odds of a haunting increase or do the odds of a haunting increase? And is that haunting then going to be a residual haunting, essentially the replay of those traumatic events over and over for others to endure? Or could it be a, a very conscious haunting, a very intelligent one? that simply wants their story to be told and wants others to know what happened. Seeking justice, if you will. That's the question we have to ask about our next story. As a mother-son relationship goes horribly wrong. Take a listen. Hey, Tony, Jenny, Carol, and Harper. I want to thank you for the show and everything you guys are doing during this time. The extra episodes have been getting me through my work days while in quarantine. I'm an EPP and a gravekeeper, and I absolutely love your podcast. I'll be changing the names of the people involved in the story so everyone is anonymous. When I graduated from college, my best friend, we'll call her Emily, and I moved to Colorado. We had first met Emily and moved to Colorado from my hometown in Iowa during the fifth grade. I remember the teacher telling us that a new student would be joining our class from out of state. I somehow knew we would be close friends, and I was determined to bring her into my group of friends. We pretty much have been inseparable ever since, and she's like family to me now. She had so many stories about Colorado and frequently talked about moving back there one day. During my senior year of college, I knew I wanted to move out of state once I graduated so I could experience living outside of the Midwest. I had a friend in Northern California, which I had visited and planned to move to that area. Then one day, Emily called and asked me if I would move to Colorado with her when I graduated. She wanted to be closer to her family there, but she needed someone to move with her. I knew this was her lifelong dream and I wanted to move to another state, so it was a win-win. Moreover, she was my best friend, so of course I said yes. During spring break of my senior year of college, we went to Colorado to look at apartments. I was not sure what to expect since I'd never been to Colorado. I was a little nervous about getting there and not liking it. Luckily, I immediately fell in love with the mountains and the natural beauty of Colorado. I'm a big nature person, so this was right up my alley. We looked at a couple of apartment complexes in a few different suburbs of Denver. We needed something budget-friendly and only for six months. Emily's aunt and uncle owned a secondary home, which their son John wanted to buy once his lease was up. We all planned to move in together once John's lease was up, but we needed to find an apartment in the meantime. We found an apartment complex with availabilities in May, which was perfect. It was in the same town where her grandpa, aunt, and uncle resided. Her uncle was the chief of police in the town, so we felt a little safer being there. We signed the paperwork and reserved an apartment that would be available in May. I ended up moving into the apartment a week and a half before Emily. She was living in New Mexico and had a couple of weeks left at her job. I went to the leasing office to get the keys, and the office manager explained they would be moving us to a different apartment in a different building because the apartment they initially reserved for us was unavailable. She escorted me to the new apartment building, which was across the street from the leasing office. We were located on the second floor of the apartment complex. The stairs leading up to the apartment were located on the outside of the building, which I love because we were still outdoors and we'd always be visible. As we started walking up the stairs, I immediately felt a weird vibe. The energy felt off, but I could not pinpoint the cause of it. I'm an empath, so this is not entirely unusual for me. I thought I was picking up the energy of the people on the first or third floor. It's not uncommon for me to be able to stand outside a home and sense when someone is upset or having a bad day. So I shrugged it off and proceeded to follow the office manager into our apartment. 
I loved the layout of the apartment. The apartment was open with plenty of windows, and it was perfect for two young adults. I did the typical run-through with the office manager, and she handed me the keys. Before she left, she explained how to get to the laundry facility. It was attached to the back of our apartment. I would have to walk up the stairs to the third floor, walk down the hallway, and then walk back down the stairs leading to the second floor, and the laundry facility would be right there. This is an important detail for later in the story. I began to unpack the items from my car, which included an air mattress, because the moving truck would not be arriving for another three days with all the large furniture. Once I was unpacked, I stood at my bedroom window, observing the rest of the complex and admiring the mountains off in the distance. Suddenly, I got an overwhelming sensation of being watched. It felt like someone was standing outside the room watching me. It did not feel threatening, and it immediately dissipated as I began to walk through the apartment to investigate. I ended up just laughing at myself and chalked it up to being anxious about living in a new place. I needed to do my laundry later that week. As I began walking up the stairs to the third floor, I started to get a tingling sensation down the back of my neck. I could tell something was not right, but I had to proceed to the third floor to get to the laundry room. As soon as I stepped foot on the third floor, I came to a complete stop because I was hit with an overwhelming feeling of oppression, anxiety, and despair. The air felt heavy, and I wanted to curl into a ball and despair. It caught me so off guard, I gasped and dropped my laundry bag. I immediately knew something horrible had happened on this floor. I knew someone had died, and I kept picturing a gun and a head injury. I was stunned because this feeling was so intense and I'd never experienced anything like it. I immediately picked up my laundry bag, ran down the hallway, raced down the stairs, heading towards the second floor laundry room. Once I got into the laundry room, I stood there for a while to process what I had just experienced. I knew I was sensitive due to having been exposed to paranormal happenings as a child. I had experiences with ghosts and shadow figures when I was little. I also knew I was an empath and was accustomed to picking up the energy of the living, but I had never experienced walking into an area and receiving information like that. The inner knowing that someone had died up there creeped me out. By the time my laundry was finished, I had calmed down enough to brave walking back up to the third floor so I could get back to my apartment. I concluded that someone on the third floor might have committed suicide sometime in the past, and I was feeling the emotional residue of such a tragic event. Little did I know, the event that occurred on the third floor was far worse than anything I could have ever imagined. Emily moved into the apartment a week later, and we were so excited to see each other again. We started unpacking her belongings, made plans for the evening. We ordered pizza from her favorite pizza place and decided to binge watch horror movies since they were our favorite. I decided not to tell her what I had experienced on the third floor because I didn't want to freak her out. Plus, I was not entirely sure what I experienced. In the middle of one of the movies, we started hearing intense banging noises coming from the apartments above us. It literally sounded like the person above us was having an intense dance party while slamming large bags of potatoes on the floor. This became a recurring issue as time went on. It usually happened in the evenings around 5 to 7 p.m. and would last for 3 to 5 minutes. We eventually got used to it. Emily and I have a dark sense of humor and started saying, oh God, there he goes dropping the dead bodies again because the thuds would be so loud and random. We also realized the person who lived above us was a little off. Remember several instances where we would be walking up the stairs to get to apartment and we'd look up and see him standing at his window staring at us with a blank expression on his face. The second we made eye contact with him, he would start pounding on the window until we got into our apartment. His behavior was bizarre, and luckily, we did not run into him very often. At some point towards the end of our lease, his mother came to live with him for a while because he had become emotionally unstable while living there. I only knew this because I ran into her in the laundry room one day, and she seemed like she needed to get something off her chest. I could feel the anxiety emanating from her and asked her how she was doing and if she was new to the complex. She needed to talk about what was going on with her son. By the end of the conversation, I felt bad for both and hoped he'd be able to get the help he needed. One night, Emily and I went over to her aunt and uncle's house for dinner. They enjoyed having family dinners once a month when everyone's schedules aligned. We were always invited to dinner along with Emily's grandfather and her two cousins. 
During this evening, we'd been living in the apartment for close to four months. We were discussing our plans to move in with her cousin, John, in a couple of months, and we expressed how excited we were to move into the house and were looking forward to getting out of the apartment. They asked if everything was going okay in the apartment, and we told them about the strange man who lived above us and other experiences we had with other tenants. At some point, we started telling them about the loud noises and joked that it sounded like he was dropping dead bodies on the floor. Everyone in the room immediately froze when we said this, and her aunt literally dropped her fork and looked pale. We looked around the room, and Emily asked, What? Did something happen there? Her uncle said, "Uh, It's nothing, honey. I had a large drug bust in that building many years ago. It was in the apartment below you guys, and it's nothing to worry about. Drugs were still very much a problem in the complex, so we dropped the conversation. When we got back to the apartment, we both agreed that they had lied to us. We thought their reactions were a little dramatic for a routine drug bust, and we already had a feeling that someone had died in that building. A couple weeks later, I was in the apartment by myself while Emily was spending the day with her boyfriend. I decided to have a lazy Sunday, so I was laying on the couch watching I Know What You Did Last Summer when I suddenly got an overwhelming feeling of being watched. My gaze immediately went towards the hallway which led to the bathroom on the right side of the hall. I suddenly got a flash image in my mind of a bloody woman standing at the end of the hall. She was looking at me while slowly raising her arm to point a finger towards the bathroom. However, this image was in black and white in my mind, but I somehow knew she had blood on her. I'm not talking about a little bit of blood. This woman was drenched in blood. I blinked a couple of times, shook my head. I never experienced something like that before and was like, wow. I really need to lay off the scary movies because it's beginning to mess with my mind. However, the image was burned into my mind and I had a feeling it was more than my imagination. Fast forward to a couple of days before we moved out of the apartment, Emily's uncle and her cousin John came over to help us pack and move some of our bigger belongings to John's house, which was a mile away from where we were currently living. Her uncle stepped into apartments and I could see his eyes scanning the living room area. He walked to the corner of our living room, pointed up to the ceiling and said, it happened right here. Then he proceeded to tell us once he learned what apartment building we were in. He actually paid a visit to the leasing office to make sure we were not living in the apartment where it happened. Puzzled, I looked at him and asked, what happened here? He looked at us and said, "Uh, I can't tell you girls. The story, you only have a couple nights left in the apartment. Just just don't, don't worry about it. Emily and I looked at each other and then looked back at him and said, you can't walk into our apartment, say something like that, and then not tell us what happened because now we're really freaked out. We could tell he really wanted to tell us the story and there was no way we were going to let him leave without telling us. In addition, we were not going to settle for the fictitious drug bust story He tried to spin a couple of months ago. We assumed someone committed suicide, but the story he was about to tell us was far worse than anything we could have imagined. I want to warn you, this is graphic and disturbing. Here's a story her uncle recounted. Some of the details may not be 100% accurate as he told them, but this is what I remember. In 1986, a woman and her son lived in the apartment above us. She was a single mom who was divorced, and her ex-husband lived in West Virginia. Her son had two close friends, and they apparently loved horror movies. They often referred to themselves as Freddy, Jason, and Michael, and they were around 13 to 14 years old. One day, her son got the bright idea of stealing his mother's paycheck and car so they could move to West Virginia and live off the land. The son said to pull this off, they would have to kill his mother. The son and his two friends devised a plan to make this happen. On the night of the mother's murder, the boy stood on either side of the entryway to the apartment. When the mother walked into the apartment, one of the friends had a dog choker and started strangling her as the other boys quickly closed the door. The three boys realized strangling her was taking far too long, so one of them grabbed a serrated butter knife and repeatedly stabbed her as the other boy continued to choke her. The boys began to panic because she was not dying as fast as they thought she would. So the third boy grabbed a hammer and bludgeoned her to death. When she was dead, they used her body as target practice. They repeatedly shot her with a BB gun. They even shot her up 
her nose cavity, even though there was not much left to her face. They then drug her body to the bathtub, and that's where they left her. Emily's uncle was a new detective when the case occurred. He said it was by far the most heinous crime scene of his career. He had never seen that much blood. He said there was so much blood that it saturated the floors and began leaking into the apartment below, which was our apartment. That's why he stood in the corner of our living room and pointed to the ceiling because that is where the blood had leaked into what was now our apartment. He said the woman's face was so disfigured that it looked like someone shot her in the head with a shotgun. Her skull had completely caved in and her face was unrecognizable as ever being human. At first, the boys showed no signs of remorse when they were brought in for questioning. The two friends eventually showed guilt and sorrow for what they had done, but the son was emotionless. He said the son's behavior throughout the whole investigation and trial was eerie because there was no emotional response to what he did, and there was no remorse. Her uncle said the boy had cold, dead eyes, devoid of any kind of emotion, and he was certain the boy was either a sociopath or a psychopath. This was back before juveniles could be tried as adults, so they spent five years in juvenile detention and were released back into the public. Emily and I were in shock and were completely horrified by what happened to this poor woman. The fear, panic, and betrayal this woman must have felt during her final moments were heartbreaking. Everything I'd been seeing was true. The trauma to the head, gunshot, the bloody woman pointing towards the bathtub, the pounding that was coming from the apartment above us, and the odd behavior of the tenant in that apartment all added up. Then we began to wonder what if we had been experiencing was residual energy or if her spirit had been trapped in the apartment since it was sudden and a traumatic death. Also, there was no justice because the three boys essentially got away with murder. They'd only served five years in juvenile detention, and then they were free to reintegrate into society and live their lives. She did not deserve what happened to her, and the thought of her spirit being trapped there saddened us greatly. For the last three days, we lived there each night with little candle, joined in hands and said a few prayers for her. I'll never forget her story and the experiences I had in that apartment. It's been 10 years since I lived there, and I still pray for her to this day. I hope. She's at peace. stories online want a commercial free experience of the show with access to the world's largest audio archive of ghost stories sign up at apple podcast right now and try it for three days free ghostpodcast.com or patreon.com slash real ghost stories